Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. And today our topic matter is copper toxicity. Now I know that seems like maybe a, an odd subject, but you know, I'm seeing more and more um, customers coming in, uh, especially to the Lompoc store, with reports of heavy metal poisoning, copper toxicity, things that you would have not heard about too much in the past. I'm now seeing it more and more. So I've been delving into additional research regarding this subject. And I want to address it with you tonight because I think it's worth looking at, particularly if you have some of the, uh, the issues that are arising as a result of copper toxicity. So when we first of all look at what the sources of copper, now first of all, copper is necessary. You have to have copper for a nervous system, muscle, uh, tissue repair, especially if you work out, you can metabolize and burn off uh, a lot of copper and it's required for tissue repair. But the problem lies is when, when certain other mineral levels are too low, the copper level is high or you have very high copper levels and you end up with what's called copper toxicity. So when we look at potential sources for copper excess, the list is uh, pretty intensive. <laughs> and I kind of thought this was kind of funny because the very first thing in my research it listed was beer. I can't tell you why, it must be in the processing or whatever they derive it from, but beer is very high in copper. Uh, maybe because hops is high in copper, I have no idea, but it is. Uh, copper cookware, copper plumbing. Now most of us have some source of copper plumbing, particularly if we live in an older home. And so it oftentimes is suggested that you have your water tested if you have copper plumbing uh, to see whether or not you may be getting a copper overload. Now I think more common what we're seeing nowadays is industrial waste, pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides that are coming in our water uh, primarily from our, in our foods, uh, which it doesn't wash off. Uh, no matter how much they want to tell you, you're only going to get surface wash, but the uptake of the copper is a result of these. And even pasteurized milk has higher, now raw milk, no, but pasteurized milk has higher copper levels. Uh, certain foods, uh, particularly shellfish, have higher copper levels. Swimming pool chemicals, high fructose corn syrup. Boy, that one is full of to uh, copper toxicity along with mercury as well. I think we've had a prior show about high fructose corn syrup. Uh, it's a poison beyond poisons. Hair colors, permanent um, uh, wave solutions. Uh, the use of oral contraceptives uh, can cause uh, copper toxicity. And then of course tobacco, because remember tobacco or mostly cigarettes are sprayed with tons and tons of herbicide, pesticides, insecticides, and a lot of other different chemicals, over a hundred different chemicals in uh, most standard uh, uh, cigarettes that you buy off the shelf. So those seem to be our primary sources that we have to, uh, to address. And if you do an excess of any of these, that could be problematic. I could think of a combination here of someone who drinks beer, <laughs> has copper plumbing, copper cookware, eats a ton of pesticide-ridden food, does a lot of swimming, drinks a lot of pasteurized milk, colors their hair, and uses oral contraceptive and smokes, you're going to have to toxic uh, copper <laughs> toxicity. So looking at how many of these risk factors may be something you may want to address as to whether or not you may want to test for uh, copper toxicity. Now, you determine copper toxicity through blood, urine tests, or hair analysis. And sometimes I've had physicians that will refuse to do a copper analysis. So you can order these types of tests online where you pull your hair from your roots, um, uncolored hair, because obviously if you've got some color on there, it changes it but uncolored hair and you send it off and you can get a good idea whether or not you have any heavy metals or excessive amounts of copper. Hair analysis are wonderful for um, determining minerals and nutrients oftentimes. So something to address here that can throw off uh, copper, uh, le uh, your readings on copper levels, and that's extremely physically active. People oftentimes have or will show through blood and urine high amounts of copper. It may not show up in their hair, but blood and urine tests will be thrown off. Now, during an illness or an injury or after surgery, copper is released uh, from the tissues 
in order to promote tissue repair to the areas that um, require repair. So it is very necessary that there be some coffer just when they're um, as an overload. So you're, um, you're, when you have these types of things going on, your readings may not be uh, very uh, accurate. Also characteristic of anemia, cirrhosis of the liver, leukemia, and niacin deficiency will also throw off copper levels. Now what's interesting as I talk about what happens as a result of copper toxicity, what happens, you'll see some of this toxicity also causes these types of disorders as well too. Remember too that any readings during pregnancy will also be thrown off. Now there is a disease called Wilson's disease and what this is basically is it's a genetic disorder uh, in which the body cannot metabolize copper and as a result, oh boy, you'll end up with copper toxicity. One of the main treatments for Wilson's uh, disease is high levels of zinc in order to counteract the effects of uh, excessive amounts of copper. Adrenal deficiency. Now, as high stress people, particularly in high stress jobs or type A personalities, when you have adrenal uh, deficiency, you also uh, deplete tremendous amounts of zinc. And as a result of that, you can end up with copper uh, toxicity. Now, uh, copper toxicity will show itself in diarrhea, skin conditions such as eczema. It can cause or contribute to anemia, high blood pressure, kidney disease, PMS, sickle cell anemia, severe nervous system uh, disorders, such as autism, behavioral problems, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, stuttering, senility. So it would be strongly suggested if you have any of uh, emotional or mental disorders or any of these things that I mentioned here, that you have a copper toxicity check. Uh, very, very uh, contributing factor to your mental health issues. Now, as far as diet is concerned, your water needs to be a clean source. And I, I think your local source should get tested um, there are uh, water filters, uh, reverse osmosis, that can be helpful here, but I would still, if you have copper plumbing, have your water checked, particularly if you have any of the other risk factors involved. Increase your intake of sulfur-rich foods, and that would include your garlic, your onions, your eggs. All of those sulfur-rich foods help you uh, get rid of excessive amounts of copper levels. So eat them, you know, they may not smell pretty, but they sure get rid of excessive uh, um, uh, copper. Apple, or uh, particularly pectins that are found in organic apples. I'm not talking about pesticide-laden apples. There's enough estrogens from pesticide chemicals in a non-organic apple to change a woman's mood. So strongly suggest organic apples. But these pectins can bind to heavy metals, including excessive amounts of copper and in the digestive tract and remove them out of the body. So that can be grapefruit pectins, but primarily apple pectins in an organic form, please. You know, the government issued a dirty dozen list, uh, and they actually fell short of listing uh, or suggesting that these particular items be purchased organic. But you can look online for that dirty dozen list and get an idea about what things are really high in pesti pesticides and chemicals, and apples are one of them. Supplementation, and this is um, some of this is maintenance, and some of this is if you do tend to have uh, or carry higher toxicity levels of copper. Always look for if you, especially if you have those other risk factors, a multivitamin that does not have copper in it, or minimal amounts of copper, or good levels of zinc at least. Uh, the ones you're going to buy at a local warehouse, chances are they're going to have higher copper and lower zinc levels. Esterified or a ester C with bioflavonoids, and I wrote the do a dosage on there, but your C's are very, very important as copper chelators. We don't think about vitamin C as being that, but it's very important for heavy metal detoxification, including copper. Zinc. Now, we now know that excessive copper and lack of zinc can contribute to male prostate cancer. So it's very, very important for men to really keep the zinc levels at a decent level. And I, I, I would always keep it at least 30 milligrams with mo most men that are 55 or above. But if you do have uh, excessive copper or you have the risk factors, um, what zinc affects is how much copper is actually stored in the tissues. 
So zinc will, um, you'll just carry enough just necessary for the body to repair tissues and not excessive amounts. So it's very important to have adequate amount of zinc. And most Americans are zinc deficient. Zinc is really important also for the immune system too. Uh, adequate amounts of chelated calcium citrate hydroxyapatate along with magnesium citrate amino chelated forms. I'm not talking about the MAGOX that they've been advertising on the TV or on the radio stations. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Or that more of my doctors send people in asking for MAGOX. It only has a 4% absorption rate. Junk, chemical. Amino chelated are what is necessary. And these actually aid and abed in the elimination of excessive copper and heavy metals as well. And I think the National Institute of Health said over 90% of Americans are magnesium deficient. So a chelated form is always best. L-cysteine and L-methionine, I've written the dosage down on there, 500 milligrams, it should say twice a day, aids in the el uh, elimination of copper, but it also, they also help with protecting the liver, um, especially in acetylcysteine, which is a kind of a sustained release um, form that goes into the liver. Uh, actually works wonderfully for detoxification of the liver and for fatty liver disease as well, too. There are a couple of trace minerals, including magnesium and molybdenum, which are rarely found except in good multivitamins. These are trace minerals that actually aid and abet in the excretion of copper and uh, over accumulation of copper as well, too and these you're not gonna find in most of your fruits and vegetables anymore. It ain't gonna happen from your diet. Now I've listed uh, one of the last things, and this is an option to you as well too, and that is the chelation process. Whenever you have heavy metals or excessive amounts of uh, copper or heavy metals in the body, there are certain um, compounds, one known as EDTA, which can bind to these excessive metals or excessive copper in the vascular system and the tissues and throughout the blood, I should say, and remove them provided that the pectin levels or adequate amount of pectin fibers are in the bowel. There's also something known as intravenous chelation. Um, I know there's very few doctors that do that, but that is also available and it's called chelation therapy. And so if you do show copper uh, toxicity along with every other heavy metals, if you don't want to use the form that's called oral chelation with an EDTA combination, you can do the IV. You know, as we become more and more chemical ridden, we're going to see more and more of these uh, toxicity levels. And like I said, you know, if you're concerned about it, you can go online, you can order these uh, little in-home kits, and I think they range between $150 and $200. Utilize the hair and ship it off and find out whether or not this is an issue for you, and then find somebody with some good knowledge about how to chelate whatever you've been exposed to. Thank you very much. Next, we're gonna be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And today we're going to do a breathing exercise. I've had a lot of stressed out people this, uh, <laughs> this week, probably more so than ever, um, and probably myself a little bit included in that. There's a lot going on in the world. Uh, we see a lot of things happening around us, and it's very frustrating um, when politicians lie and uh, we see things happening uh, in our country that we're not very happy about, <sighs> and lots of other things as well, too. But anyway, I want to review this breathing exercise, and, and with this, I'd like you to participate. And it's a very basic exercise, and basically what you're going to do is you're going to sit up. You can be in a chair or on the floor, but I need your back to be straight and your spine be straight. And we're going to actually do a practical application with this. I really want you to, to sit here and do this with us, because I'm going to take the full four minutes or so to do this exercise. What you're going to do is you're going to make sure you have your fists slightly clenched, okay? And throughout this breathing exercise, you're going to have your teeth meet each other. You're not clamping down on your jaw or squeezing together. It's just your mouth is shut and your teeth are joined. Now, to talk you through this uh, meditation exercise for calming the mind, it is 
basically going to allow me that I, I'm going to have to talk, so I won't be able to do it. But what it is, is we're going to go through 10 cycles where we inhale five, breath, uh, five counts, exhale 10 counts, inhale five counts, exhale 10 counts. And we're going to go through this, and when we're all done, you're going to recognize how calm your mind is. So here we go, and we're going to start this. So close your eyes. Okay, now I'd like you to start with five breaths in, or five second breaths in. Exhale, 10. Inhale, 5. 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 Exhale, 10. Inhale, 5, one more time. Exhale, 10. Now what this exercise does is it calms the mind, you use your breath, so you can use this before you go into an exam or you have a speech or a presentation or you're gonna go in and ask your boss for a raise or you have some naughty children, you're just gonna go into the bathroom and just run that cycle, 10 cycles of five in, 10 out, five in, 10 out. You'll calm your mind down, you'll have better focus and concentration and I'm hoping that will help you some. Next, we're gonna be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you very much. Welcome back. And with us today for the research portion of our show is Ralph Turchian. And thank you for that intro. Mm -hmm. Now, for one interesting point, if you wanna be able to purchase a very inexpensive supplement, which according to researchers uh, from the University of Copenhagen is just as effective as the drugs for type 2 diabetes. Now obviously it didn't specify whether it be metamorphin, glucophage, glyabride, or whatever uh, other class of medication there is, but guess what? The amino acid arginine. Now in their words was this, arginine stimulates a hormone linked to the treatment of type 2 diabetes. It works just as well as several established drugs on the market, probably many times less expensive too. The research to find has just been published in the Scientific Journal of Endocrinology. They said, quote, in fact, the amino acid is just as effective as several well-established drugs for type two diabetics at postdoc Christopher Clemenson. And again, probably with hardly any side effects. For those of us who know arginine, it's virtually void of side effects, unless you have cold sores, which you gotta be a little careful to balance with lysine. We have demonstrated that both lean and fat laboratory animals benefit considerably from arginine supplements. 
In fact, we improve glucose metabolism by as much as 40% in both groups, lean and obese. We also see that arginine increases the body's production of a glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1, an intestinal hormone, those intestines are important, which plays an important role in regulating appetite as well as glucose metabolism. Arginine, next best appetite suppressor and blood sugar balancer, sounds like a good combo there, in which therefore use numerous drugs treating type 2 diabetes. And again, printed in the American Scientific Journal of Endocrinology, the amino acid is L-arginine, just to keep in mind. But if you are susceptible to cold sores, buy with caution, and always look to balance it out with a little bit of L-lysine. All right, after that, we look at one way we could save money in our healthcare system, but unlikely it's probably ever gonna get used. This study done by the European Society of Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism, otherwise known as ESPEN, they discovered was this. By giving patients just a simple nutrient cocktail or multivitamin, yes, these are doctors recommending multivitamins in a hospital, they discovered out of 1 million cases, they discovered 21% or 2.3 day reduction in the length of the stay of a typical 30 day hospital stay, and two, a 21.6% or 4,734 dollar reduction in patient hospitalization cost. Yes, so multivitamins are not gonna be very profitable hospitals, but they will be profitable for you. Again, this was published in the American Journal of Managed Care. They said, quote, because oral nutritional supplements are formulated to provide advanced nutrition and calories for patients at a relatively inexpensive to provide the sizable savings they generate may make supplementation a cost-effective therapy, meaning most likely you're never gonna hear about it. So, something to think about, take it to your own initiative, speak to your medical care provider. If you go into a hospital, a hospital stay, let them know what supplements you're taking, but if you don't want to stay there for a shorter period of time than the other people, then look about taking a multivitamin before going into the hospital. All right, now we look at aging. And guess what is real amazing about aging is you not only could slow it, you could stop it from ever beginning. And what they discovered was this. And this was reported in the September 3rd Journal of Cell Metabolism. There is a hormone in the brain. Often you'll hear this hormone sometimes uh, in a combination or a relationship to like resveratrol or low calorie dieting or things along those lines. But this is called, if I can pronounce it right, sirtuin, otherwise known as S-I-R-T-1. And what they discovered is this operates in the brain and brings about a significant delay, I'm not saying slow, delay in the aging and process and therefore, of course, increases longevity. And they discovered, the EMA and his team is a CERT-1, prompts neural activity in specific areas of the hypothalamus of the brain, which triggers dramatic physical changes in skeletal muscle and increases in vigor and longevity. In our studies of mice that express SRIT1 in the brain, we found that the skeletal muscular structure, listen to this now, the skeletal muscular structure of old mice resembles that of young muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. A 20 month old mouse, which is equivalent to 70 years in human age, looks as active as a five-month-old mouse. So, whether you like it or not, we found ways to basically make mice practically immortal, <laughs> which is a whole other problem. <laughs> the team studied the mice have been genetically modified to overproduce SIRT1 or sirtuin. Some of the mice had been engineered to overproduce in body tissue and engineered to more, produce more of the CERT protein only in the brain. So, what happened was the ones in the brain lived the longest. We found that only the mice that expressed the SRT in the brain, not the body, but the brain, which is interesting because you would think it would be normally 
think that's counterintuitive, had significant lifespan extension and delay, not slowing the aging process, delaying the aging process uh, in aging. Just like normal mice reared until dietary restriction regimes. It says basically, also too, the median lifespan of the mice in the study was extended by 16% in females and 9% in males. Translated to humans, this could be about 13 to 14 year increase in longevity for women alone, making the average lifespan almost 100 years. So for this, it would add another seven years for men, increasing the average lifespan to mid 80s. Sorry guys, not gonna work as well. But also, too, delayed cancer activation at the same time, where usually the older you are, the more likely you're gonna have mutations taking place. So, but how are those mutations gonna begin taking place until much later on in life? And therefore, again, it delayed the beginning of aging, didn't slow it, which is really interesting because it throws a wrench in what's called oxidative stress to the cells. So something to really think about is SIRT-1, as far as extending longevity probably be a lot better than going over to China and illegally harvesting organs like a lot of other wealthy people do. All right, outside of that, <laughs> vaccinations. Now, often a lot of us hear about vaccinations, and vaccinations can be good or bad. I, for one, am more of a fan of natural acquired immunity. And of course, you'll say, well, I benefit from the herd. If that herd is the chronically ill individuals which take over half the diet and sugar and so on and so forth, and mostly all like you're medicated, yeah, then I benefit from that herd by not getting sick, so you say. But those vaccinated against H1N2, now this herd we're talking about is herd of pigs, so to say, found out that those who were vaccinated against one strain of flu became more susceptible to getting infected by another strain of flu. So the antibodies, for one thing, cause your susceptibility in a vaccine to a cause to another thing. Now, a lot of us know, when we were growing up, we were exposed to the measles, mumps, chicken pox. In fact, we even did the exact opposite. We had inoculation parties. We all got together and hung out and basically enhanced our immune systems all together and spent one week away from school when the parents knew exactly when we were going to get sick. And of course, that gave us benefits as far as reduction in certain other diseases and asthma and things along those lines. So they know the study stands true. But what they looked at is these animals respond by making antibodies that blocked the virus, is so the vaccine worked, in which case it became more susceptible to the swine flu H1N1 because it dropped their defenses. My time is up, I have to end the article on this one. And again, as usual, thank you for listening. Wow, very good, appreciate it very much, Ralph. Thank you very much for joining our show um, on TAP TV, also accessible on youtube.com forward slash V like in Victor, H film. Thank you very much.